All right, I'd like to introduce Omer Shlomovitz to the stage from Egonomia. I always have trouble pronouncing it, sorry. Um, he's going to tell us about Fantastic Beasts and ZK Hardware. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So my name is Omer. I'm the founder of Ingonyama. This is how you pronounce it. Uh, the talk today is uh, going to be packed. I'm going to try to get as much uh, information I can and infuse it to you. If I'm missing something or if you have questions, feel free to reach out later. Um, I'm going to start with the scope of what do I mean when I say zero knowledge, ZK, ZKP. I'm going to use uh, this word many times in the talk. And obviously we have many ZKPs like in different shapes, forms, and um, we can, I don't know, maybe divide them into several families. So we have uh, this line of work, Quicksilver, Mystique, Wolverine, Ant-Man, uh, which is not the focus here. It's not about, these are, uh, I think uh, you can classify them as interactive um, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, we have also zero knowledge based on MPC in the head kind of line of work, Ligero, Ligero++ plus plus and so on, uh, while fantastic work with really great performance. Um, again, not what we look into right now when we talk about ZK in the context of hardware, and even not Mali, Nova, Code 16 and, and variations of Plonk, which are um, the protocols that we base most of our systems on. Um, what I'm trying to, or what I want to focus on is actual uh, systems that are, let's call them production ready or close to it, and we have many examples to this in, in the space, right? Um, here I give a few of them. So these are systems that besides just the ZK uh, protocol that is in like the back end or something, there's also significant software engineering effort that we put into making them uh, meet real world uh, criteria. Right. Um, so we are used, when, when we talk about uh, ZKPs, we used to kind of discuss uh, or to mention the benefits and uh, all of the advantages we get with ZK and ZK snarks, stacks and so on, right? It can be in a small uh, proof, fast verification and so on. However, in real world systems, we deal with um, asymptotic complexities that are no longer, right? Now everything becomes concrete. So we need to take into account all of this. Um, uh, into, uh, um, into our consideration, right? So what I mean by that, first, uh, we want to focus on the prover overhead, uh, the computation of the prover, which is the obvious um, kind of goal for acceleration in hardware. Based on uh, Justin Teller uh, blog for S16Z, he estimated seven orders of magnitude uh, overhead in terms of comparing to just running the computation on, on a CPU, right? Um, he's done it kind of based on analysis of a front end and back end, uh, as you can see in, in this uh, figure. Now, what it means is that we want to try and accelerate metrics uh, such as uh, matrices such as latency, throughput, and even memory. I mean, this is uh, surprising. There's this quote here from one of the papers um, that is not uh, coming from the uh, it, it's more from, I think, from one of the systems that are for interactive SNARKs and, and our interactive ZKP, and they asked them to, uh, in, in the reviewer asked them to kind of try and compare the memory for, um, uh, to other systems. There's a huge blow up, I'll touch a bit uh, on this later, but we also want to uh, try to optimize at least the memory consumption while computing a proof. Okay. Um, now, to do all of that, we obviously have algorithms uh, which have been around for uh, a few decades now. We have software engineering and we have hardware, which is what we want to focus here. So, as I mentioned, ZK Prover is the main, the main goal of what we want to improve is computation uh, and try to accelerate it or make it more optimized or efficient. And uh, let's try to analyze what does it mean, okay? so. Um, Let's look at the cake. This is when we look at the actual computation that happens inside of a prover. So we have basically three parts. We have the multiscalar multiplication. We have the Fourier transform, the NTT. Right? NTT is a Fourier transform over finite fields. And we have what I call here fluff. Right? So this is the rest of it. And I'll explain a bit about it later. Um, so to give a concrete example, this is uh, uh, data from uh, RapidSnark. RapidSnark is uh, a backend uh, based on Gold 16. 
So we know that there is pairing. So we have basically two elliptic curves. So we have two times uh, MSM, as you can see, for G1 and G2. And the G2 is even more complex because it's over extension field computation. And, and you can see that roughly for different sizes of circuits, we get here like 90% uh, MSM and 5% and, uh, to 7 NTT. And, uh, and so it means that there's also fluff, right? So it's, I guess, similar. I mean, don't, it, it's an estimation. Obviously, it's, it's nothing here is going to be uh, concrete. It's just kind of to give you a high-level ID. Now, another thing that's important to say is that this is what, let's, let's name it SNARK, okay? Just for the sake of this conversation. Um, we can also look at something called a Stark, where um, basically we eliminate uh, MSM and we are left only with NTT. We still have fluff, right? We cannot uh, ignore it. Um, and also there are systems like, like Nova, where there's uh, the opposite, either there are no NTTs, uh, only MSM, okay? So basically all of them are based on the same uh, computational problems. Now, once we understand that, let's try to build together some, some idea on how to accelerate this proof of computation, okay? Let's um, do it like step at a step, uh, step by step together. So we have the host and we have this uh, uh, box that um, is our dedicated hardware. Uh, and, and the first thing that comes to mind is obviously let's just accelerate the MSM, right? So we, we need to add some memory and, and then some IP core for the MSM. But uh, this would give us, remember that we have like maybe 80, 90% MSM. So at the best we can get like 10x, if MSM is completely eliminated, we get a 10x improvement. And this is not why we do hardware. I mean, 10x is, um, uh, is, not, is not a good uh, motivation for uh, going into dedicated hardware. So the next thing that comes to mind is after MSM, let's also accelerate uh, NTT, right? Obviously the second big uh, like stone here. So let's imagine that we add another block of memory and then this IP core of entity, right? Now here, surprisingly, we get another bottleneck, which is uh, in the interface between the host and uh, the, uh, the hardware, right? Uh, so I mentioned there is a huge blow up in the data that we generate inside of, uh, or as part of the prover computation. And uh, basically what it means is that the new bottleneck will become the speed in which we can send information between the host and uh, the hardware, right? So again, we're gonna get some, we're gonna get stuck. So the only way that uh, makes sense now is to also add the fluff, right? So let's divide the fluff into two parts. One is some modules that we can accelerate here. I'm gonna uh, use an example of hash function, a ZK friendly hash function that uh, might benefit from acceleration inside of the fluff. Again, for some systems, this might be much more than 5%, but for our mental model, this is enough. And also for some just field computations, uh, let's also add some uh, CPU, like uh, ARM or RISC-V core, okay? So now if we look at what we got, we basically have this um, chip, right, that has ZK end-to-end, -end, right? We just give it the input, uh, the, the statement, the problem, and then we get as a output the proof itself. Now, once we have this uh, idea in mind, let's try and uh, look at specific hardwares that we have available for us today. And the first two I want to discuss are GPUs and FPGAs, okay? So graphical processing units and field programmable uh, gate array. Um, and let's try to do like a very high level comparison between the two. So one thing is that GPUs are almost a commodity at this point. Uh, they are everywhere. Most of you guys have uh, GPU accessible to you um, in, in, your, in your Mac, in your phone and so on. And it's not the case with FPGA. Uh, although now we see this uh, um, FPGA is in the cloud. This is kind of becoming a trend and uh, it makes the accessibility of this type of hardware um, significantly better. Another thing is the technology in which we use to generate, to, to actually produce, uh, to manufacture these chips. So GPUs um, are a few generations. This is just an example. You can find FPGAs with different technologies and also GPUs, but uh, basically here you can see the GPU 
I mean, just like out of the box gives you a uh, way better uh, performance, you know, in terms of how many transistor you can, transistors you can stick inside a given area, which also impact uh, power efficiency and so on. So this is another advantage for a GPU. Um, another thing to note is that right now when we work with GPUs, we usually use software. Uh, we write like libraries on top of CUDA and such. So it's a very um, smooth user experience or developer experience to, uh, to code in, in a GPU. Uh, while in FPGA, it's uh, still conceived, although there are ways around it, but it's still conceived like a one-time uh, programming thing. And like each time you need a new uh, design, it takes like a whole uh, a long time to actually get it done and not as part of the same run. However, in both cases, it's going to be hard to implement ZK end-to-end -end for different reasons, right? So, FP so the GPU is uh, simply uh, not customizable enough when you think about doing together um, the fluff that I mentioned, the memory management, the, uh, the MSM and the NTT. And for the FPGA, it's very limited in the resources that you get, right? So even elliptic curve addition, which is very important, as I'll show uh, in a few slides, is something that can take up to half of, the, of an FPGA, right? And this is just like one very simple um, mathematical operation. So one thing uh, that I want to also share is, is like where do we stand today in comparison of performance between the two? So I'm going to share uh, some of our results from a uh, latest paper called Pipe MSM. And um, what we chose to highlight here is uh, like the cost per running one MSM. So again, first, it's not an entire ZK. It's just like one multi scalar multiplication of given sizes. Um, you know, the, the size, the, the, the length of the MSM here uh, is so much representative, although we're interested also in, in uh, uh, lengthier MSMs. But for example, Alio is focused on the 2 to the 15, to the 16 and, and such. So, it's kind of like in, in the same where we are. It, it's in the interest area. And you can see that there is like this efficiency um, that uh, you get will, when you use this FPGA. Again, what we measure here is this like integral of the um, over time of, of the power consumption. Now, few disclaimers. Uh, one, there's a huge variance when it comes to GPUs. I mean, in, in, in hardware, it's like the same thing uh, every time, but, but the GPU, really different if it's a consumer GPU or if it's a data center GPU and, and so on. Second, as I said, larger vectors are also interested and interesting. And finally, um, I already know that both in FPGA and GPU, there are already way better uh, results than what is presented here. And I hope that maybe in ZPrize and other, we'll see some of them. Right, so this is a good point also to mention, to mention a third uh, type of hardware, which is ASIC, right? This is a, an integrated circuit that is very specific uh, to the problem at hand. And this is probably the best chance we have to, um, to get this ZK end-to-end, -end, okay? Um, we know it's kind of one, uh, one signal that we have is that at least we know in terms of power consumption, we're supposed to be 10x better uh, when it uh, compares to an FPGA, which is already uh, better than uh, a GPU. So this is kind of comparing two papers that one was on ASIC, one on uh, FPGA. It does not exist today. One of the reasons is that there's, uh, it takes like forever, like a few years to get it done, uh, to get actual uh, uh, ASIC uh, in the market. It can take two, three years even. And also there is this thesis that says that ZK, it's a risk because ZK protocols are like a moving target. Now, I don't think this is uh, the case, but I won't try to argue it here. Happy to talk about it later. All right, um, so now I want to talk about specific implementations uh, of, in hardware of, of ZK primitives, of the computation that we saw before, and kind of give you a sense um, or some intuition about what it means to uh, write them down in hardware. So we'll start with the uh, modular multiplication. So this is like a, a very basic primitive. Uh, we use it for all of the computation we do. So it's very useful to accelerate it. Basically, it's just taking A times B and do uh, some modular now, modulo Q, okay? So let's develop it a bit, right? So basically, it's AB equals to some number that we don't know of uh, times that we need to repeat Q. Do you want to try this? Yeah. 
Okay, so as I said, this is the, uh, when we try to uh, open it up, this is what we get. And in equation three, this is our estimation. So we don't know this number L, so we need to estimate it. Uh, so here we estimate it to, uh, to be this L hat, and uh, we also have an error, right? Because we might have some estimation error, which we note as K. Just rearranging the elements, we get that what we need to compute is this uh, residue R, which equals to this expression at number four. So what was commonly done before is the estimation was really tight. Like we wanted the estimation, or, or at least like previous generations of modular multiplication, wanted the estimation to be uh, as good as possible. Our idea was to uh, have more um, slack in the estimation. So we allowed the estimation to be um, with higher, larger error, which eventually translate into this block here at the bottom. It means that we need to try different values of K. Um, now, what we gain is that in this estimation above L1 hat, we are able to break it down into two multiplications that are uh, smaller. Uh, over n or n plus one bits. So this becomes very efficient, right? So this is the trick that we are doing. We kind of pay in additions, but save in multiplications, which is exactly what we want to do in hardware. Another primitive that I want to discuss is what I mentioned about the EC addition. Uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you next how it can be used, but first let's try to think um, what's the best way to implement it in hardware. So in EC addition, we basically have coordinates, and to represent an elliptical point, we can have few representations. It can be two coordinates, three coordinates. We use the projective version, which has x, y, and z coordinates, and this is the, um, the equations that basically gets us from uh, x1, y1, z1, and, and two to uh, the result, to x3, z3, y3. Now, this is the circuit that we chose to use. Now, there are two things interesting about it that makes it hardware friendly. One, there is some redundancy in this equation, so you can reuse some of the operations. And the second thing is that it is highly parallel, right? As you can see here, even visually, it's very easy to parallelize this circuit and compute it in parallel, which gives us advantage when we work in hardware, okay? So this is the point I want to make here. Now, let's move on to multiscalar multiplication. This is the expression above. Uh, which is kind of like a product between, let's say, two vectors of, one of vector of scalars, one is a vector of elliptic of points. The common way to do it is by something called the buckets method, which is a variant of Pippinger. And this is, um, th this is our circuit, this is the, the, the core of, on how we are doing it. So I want to explain it, there are three parts to, to do uh, bucket methods. Um, and basically the, the concept is very simple, right? So, we want to uh, break, again, do highly, something that is highly parallelizable. So right now, uh, the way to parallelize it is first to break each scalar into uh, segments or, or chunks of size uh, C bits. C can be, I think here is nine. And we can even do farther than that, like what, what's in, in step number two, which is segmentation. Even after we break each one of the scalars into many segments, we can break it even farther and uh, parallelize it more when we do the actual buckets computation. So to be concrete as possible, in this case, let's say that scalar are uh, size 253 bits and we take C equal nine bits. So it means that we have 29 uh, buckets, uh, bucket accumulators. This is, the, this, is this block in, um, I don't know what color it is. And each one of these bucket accumulator can be broken down, as I said, into, let's say, M equal eight uh, segments. So in each one we need to do, we have like 64 buckets. So this is exactly, it. now, what you can see is that first we have this EC addition uh, here in green at the end. So this is something that we keep doing over and over again. This is like the, um, the main computation that's being done. So we translated MSM entirely into EC addition operations that are happening in parallel um, all the time. Finally, by the way, we need to accumulate all of the things together. This is step number three. This is the final accumulation, um, which uh, also like, takes some computation time. There is this cost function uh, here at the end. 
that uh, kind of takes all of these parameters into account and uh, allows us to also simulate and test many of the parameters. I mean, usually you don't want to just implement in hardware before you have your parameters uh, fixed. Okay, um, let's move on to, uh, to NTT. So here I want to, I think, I mean, for me, the best way to explain what is uh, NTT to begin with is by just spitting out the algorithm, right, for uh, Kulituki FFT, which is the standard way we do today um, this mathematical operation. Uh, this is, by the way, used uh, in, in ZK mostly when we want to, like, multiply polynomials and so on. And the interesting thing to look at is lines um, uh, 14 and 15. This is the, the main computation that happens here. Like, this is a, a, a recursive algorithm, and you can see that you have this same operation of addition and multiplication in a constant, right? And the, the constant here is the roots of unity. So let's try to take the hardware look into, onto this problem. First thing we do is we unroll the, uh, um, the recursion of Kulituki, and we have this nice structure. So from this structure, we can uh, um, very easily see that there's this very basic building block, right, on the left, that is in charge of, or if you compose it in, 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 in the right way, you can get um, a larger and larger uh, entity uh, or vector sizes of entity. And this small building block, what it does is just this operation that uh, I talked about before. It's addition and or multiplication in a constant and addition, right? So the idea here, the, the simple idea, is just to have your hardware with as many parallel, uh, um, we call them here sub-entity blocks as possible. Obviously, the sub-entity block can be not just the basic operation, but like uh, one larger than that. Another uh, uh, parameter we can play with, uh, except of the number of uh, sub-entities we put in the hardware, is also in computing this um, constants. So one way to do it is by just writing all of them to memory and retrieving them for memory. But uh, maybe you can also compute them on the fly. So here in our um, like cost function here, we have this parameter uh, that the parameter B that gives us uh, this idea of how many we want to compute on the fly versus how many we want to retrieve from memory. K here is, is for the, like let's call it parallelization factor, and F is, is just the frequency, because obviously if we run in a higher frequency, we can have like faster time. Finally, I want to talk about the fluff. So here I'm going to choose an example, the Poseidon hash function, which uh, is a ZK-friendly hash function, and um, it's very common in uh, today's ZK systems. So basically, a hash function uh, like Poseidon is composed of three different parts. We have the um, nonlinear part, the S-box, right, like taking uh, something to the power of five. We have uh, the linear part, which is matrix multiplication, and we have some... Uh, manipulation with uh, addition of constants. So here is our design. And let me explain to you what we see here, because uh, I, I know it's, it's, this is like probably the most complex uh, uh, that we have here in, in the slides. So first thing to note is that this is uh, a multi-core design, right? And why is that? Because usually when we use Poseidon in ZK circuits, in ZK computation, we have uh, a Merkle tree or this data structure that requires us to take one input or one output of a hash function to be the input of another hash function. So this like ring design of uh, ring topology allows us to take one uh, output and connect it to the next available um, hash module avail uh, that, that can, can take it. It's also, uh, it's also multi-threaded, right? So here in, the, in green we have few Poseidon processors and the simple reason is that once you start processing a Poseidon hash, then uh, it takes more than one clock cycle. So we have all of these uh, operators or, or gates available uh, at some point. So we want to utilize them as much as possible, meaning that once we have something free, we just start another thread with another hash. So it's a multi-core multi-hash that allows us to handle um, these tree-like data structures, like, like, like Merkle tree, in a better way. And uh, what's happening in, in, like inside of this uh, green box is a, a kind of like a general oper operation that allows us to uh, do all of the S-box matrix multiplication and addition of constants 
um, like all of them fit into this, uh, this thing, okay? So obviously we need to handle memory. Um, it's uh, obviously important, but basically by having this A times B plus C, we can, uh, and, and like I can show you later if you want how every operation can be handled with like this specific box. Um, yeah, how much time do I have? Okay, so for final slides, I want to wrap up by just pointing out some products like that are based on ZK hardware. It's, uh, I don't know uh, how much, if it will make too much sense, but kind of try to put it in a way from, you know, hardware that takes huge proofs and make them like from hours to minutes all the way to, uh, you know, just already very optimized and small circuits that you want to kind of run without um, spending battery life at all, right? So obviously one of, one of the uh, products, like the first one is this SAS kind of thing, like uh, um, running ZK proofs as a service. And uh, this is something that, that can, can help, for example, ZK VM. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, cloud-based uh, marketplace or, or, or FPGAs is also something that we see on the rise. It can be very useful for ZK app developers that don't want, like they have the, they don't want to do the, um, the DevOps. They, they want just to get an infrastructure and, and just have a ZK in the replication. Uh, there's also like physical, let's call it mining uh, machines for, for some of uh, uh, ZK use cases today. And, and as I mentioned, uh, there's IP core, like take just one function, let's say for decentralized identity that makes it like really, really smooth and just like use it in uh, some other processor, like, like what you have in the iPhone. That's it. I um, want to, take, to thank Lucas, um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs>